if you turn in your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, I would tell you that he's the shortest guy in the Bible, but you probably heard that one already. He's Nehi Amaya. There we go. You didn't want to hear that one in the first place. If you grew up in church, you probably remember the first time you saw your pastor outside of a Sunday morning service. I remember when I got saved, the first time I saw Pastor Foster in regular old clothes. <laughs> and, uh, and he was doing something normal. He was at the grocery store. <laughs> he was buying some milk and some things like that, some bread. And uh, he was looking pretty mortal <laughs> in his Levi's and his University of Michigan T-shirt and uh, no tie, no flowing robe or no podium. And then you realize that he, guess what? He's, he's kind of just like us. <laughs> and uh, I remember here, uh, Dana, uh, on a Wednesday night, a couple times I had, in the winter, I wear jeans once in a while when it's cold. And she'd come and I, I was in jeans. She said, well, I've never seen you in jeans before. <laughs> I said, well, uh, that's my usual attire. I don't wear this suit. <laughs> around during the week. I would really do a job on it real quick uh, in my profession besides being here. Uh, but spiritual leaders don't always look like we expect them to. I, I remember uh, I used to try to put faces to uh, J. Vernon McGee, uh, Elizabeth Elliot, and then when I hear them on the radio, I'd never seen them in person at that time. And, but many of them don't look like I thought they would look. Uh, A.W. Tozer, Charles Spurgeon. Uh, uh, I had seen D.L. Moody. They have a wax figure of him at the, uh, 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 at the school there in Chicago. But they look different. And, uh, and then when I find out different guys have different habits and things they liked, and some guys were funny, some guys weren't so funny, and all those things. Uh, but they come in all shapes, sizes. Uh, I see some that are fluffy, some that are skinny. Uh, had a preacher that was uh, my preacher out in Pennsylvania, and that guy was skinny as a snake. Walked all the time, ate healthy. I don't know how he stayed alive eating healthy, but anyhow, uh, he, he was just really slim. Uh, him and his wife and his whole family was. Uh, well, I was much slenderer back then. But anyhow, they come in all sizes, personalities, professions. Because not all spiritual leaders are preachers. You understand that? Uh, there are all kinds of people that have uh, spiritual mentors that are not preachers. And we're going to look at one today. His name's Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah uh, served in the courts of Persian royalty and even governed Judah. Of all the hats, however, he wore the best known. He's known as the wall builder. He was a construction kind of guy. He was a hard hat kind of guy. And he rebuilt, he led the rebuilding of the walls around Jerusalem. Now, he did not build all the walls himself. <laughs> he helped do that. Nehemiah's dedication and dependence on God teaches that no matter what we do, we labor under the sovereign hand of the Lord. Remember, no matter what you do, do it as what is unto the Lord. Uh, just one thing is not more important than the other. As we looked at in Ezra even, the regular people were very important. If you don't have people in the church, <laughs> the church isn't very important because I, I can come here. I had to. Well, I'm gonna, Bob was back there and I'm not picking on him. But I came in here and preached for a little while and nobody in here. I tell you what, folks, that just is wrong. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> I just, it's not right not having you guys out there. And, and it, it, was, it was funny. I was so glad that Bob came and we recorded that. And it worked through the pandemic and, and that. I was not, not complaining there. But I got up here. It was hard to come to church to preach to nobody. And to set here down in Sunday school. When Bud wasn't up in the front teaching down there. There was no Sunday school going on. No Wednesday nights. It just was just not right. Anyhow, uh, but when, uh, when we do, no matter what we do, and God gives us the ability to do it, he blesses us for that. And he gives you a passion for it. And, uh, and, and Bud usually keeps me uh, informed about John Hill. 
John Hill does one thing. What's that, bud? Preach. <laughs> he preaches. He's getting ready to be 90, right? And uh, what's he do? He preaches. Because uh, that's what God called him to do. And uh, I, I told you a couple, three times, I, I've thought about quitting. And my wife always asks me this, do you think you can quit preaching? I said, will you shut up and leave me alone? I'm having my pity party. Just let me go on and, you know. But she always said, you can't quit. And I said, well, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> and then so a few days later, she said, well, what you still thinking? And I just tell her, just leave me alone. <laughs> when God calls you to do something, he has a passion to do it. I like to be with God's people. I have ever since I got saved, like to be with God's people. Not that I'd have to be up here. I did try it out there for a little while. God didn't let me sit very long. And that's thing you know, the guy that I was sitting under, Pat Neff, he had me teaching, filling in for him on Sundays, then every one of my buddies and everyone in the churches. So I hardly was at the church because every other Sunday I was preaching somewhere to fill in for somebody. And God says, you know, he's not done with me. And he took me on to another church. And that's the way it works. And we have a passion and dedication. The task he's given us, we get the satisfaction of a job well done. And guess who gets the glory? God does. Because if it had been up to me, guess what? I probably would have quit. And I hear great men like Charles, Chuck Swindoll says, he said, I always tell fellows, if you can do anything else, do it. <laughs> he said, because if God hasn't called you to be the pastor, he says, you'll quit. He says, if you can do something else, do it. And uh, uh, so there we go. It's a sequel. Nehemiah is a sequel to Ezra. Remember, we're working our way through the historical books. 12 of them. First we did the Pentateuch. Remember Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the first five book called the Pentateuch. That means five books. That's a really hard one on us. And then we started in the historical books. Joshua. Then we did Judges. Then we did Ruth. First and second Samuel. First and second Kings. First and second Chronicles. Then Ezra, Nehemiah. And our last one will be Esther. And that's the historical books. Now, I'm, I'm just trying to help you there. So next time when someone says, turn to the book of Ezra, you'll go, oh, yeah, I was there once. <laughs> and go there. Uh, uh, and, and the whole study is designed to whet your appetite. Because you can't take one or two Sundays and preach through any of these books and get everything out of them. There's too much in there. Now, I know some of them are hard. Some of those chronicles, whoo, those are tough. And there's a couple lists in Ezra and in Nehemiah. I'm amazed. I, I turn on recordings sometimes to hear a guy read through those names. Because I can't do it. I can't pronounce those things. He goes through them. I'm going, how did he do that? And, uh, you know, and whether he pronounced them right, I don't know. You know what? So if I pronounce them, guess what? You probably don't know if I'm pronouncing them right or not either. And if you pronounce them, I don't know either. God knows those names and we'll leave it there. But anyhow, Nehemiah and Ezra at one time were one book. Just like First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Samuel. They were all one book at one time. Uh, so, um, and, uh, and for, uh, for centuries they were that way. And most folks believe that Ezra wrote both of them. Ezra was a scribe and a priest. And they believe he wrote both books. We don't have any literal proof of that, but most folks believe that. Authors Bruce Wilkerson and Kenneth Boa explain the relationship between the two books. While Ezra primarily deals with the religious restoration of Judah. Remember, Ezra helped build the temple. Nehemiah is concerned with Judah's political and geographical restoration. And he's going to build the what? The walls. And so the first six chapters are devoted to the building of Jerusalem's walls because Jerusalem was the spiritual capital and political center of Judah. Without walls, the city back then wasn't, wasn't considered a city, had no protection. And so Jerusalem um, would have the walls rebuilt, and as governor, Nehemiah also established firm civil authority. Ezra and Nehemiah worked together to build the people spiritually and morally so that the restoration would be complete. So just because you have a building or walls with people inside of it doesn't mean you have a functioning community. 
They need morals. We're finding that out more and more in our country because you can't legislate morals. Do you understand that? You can't make enough laws to make people do the right things because <laughs> lawbreakers do what? They break the law. <laughs> and so you got to have morals and morals, I believe, have a spiritual root. And God can do that. Overall structure, uh, Nehemiah closely resembles that of Ezra. As I shared with you when we did Ezra, two main sections. The physical construction of the wall was chapters 1 through 6. The spiritual restoration of the people, chapters 7 through 13. So that's just a simple breakdown. First six chapters, the wall, 7 through 13. The last chapters talk about the spiritual restoration of the people. And uh, in Ezra, it was the same way except we didn't have 13 chapters. We can also look at the book, which we'll do on your outline, on the man and through the lens of the man himself and the roles he performed. First, we'll see Nehemiah as a cupbearer to the king, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 10. And then we'll see him building the wall, chapter 2, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 19, or the end of the chapter. And then chapter 7 through 13, we see him as governor of the people. He becomes their governor. And uh, three roles, one man, one heart for God. You'll see that Nehemiah had a soft heart for God, but he had a hard hat on to build the walls. That's why he's called it a hard-hearted soft man there on the, on, the out, on the message title. Cupbearer to the king. Like Ezra, Nehemiah was born in captivity under the rule of a pagan king. As the book opens, we find Nehemiah serving in Susa. That's the winter capital of Persia, a cupbearer for King Art Artaxerxes, and you'll get to meet him again in the book of, of uh, Esther. He's a cupbearer, and it's an important job. Uh, the king's very life rested in the hands of the cupbearer. He tasted the wine and the food before the king ate it to make sure it hasn't been what? Poisoned. And uh, only the most honest, trustworthy, and discreet individuals would have been chosen for this post. And so we get a little background, and Nehemiah was a trustworthy man. And he was honest, and he was discreet. Now, he hadn't been raised in Jerusalem, in Israel, but he still had a heart for Jerusalem. And God places that in those folks. A Jew's heart is still where? In Jerusalem. And uh, so he asked some questions when some people uh, come in from Jerusalem on the conditions of the city and the remnant there. And in verse 3, it says, And they said to me, chapter 1, verse 3, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. Otherwise, it's not going so good. And it says, The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So here we are. They're out there in the middle of nowhere with no protection. They don't have, there's not good finances, there's not good food, nothing's going well for them. And uh, remember, Jerusalem was destroyed at a, at a date that you'll hear me say often, 586. Nebuchadnezzar came in. And then later, under Cyrus, as we looked at last time, uh, under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Ezra, he sent them back to rebuild the temple. And that was the first wave. Remember, three waves. And Nehemiah will come with the last wave. The enemies of Judah, however, managed to influence Artaxerxes to stop the work decreed. And early in the reign, we looked at that. And Ezra and Jerusalem lay desolate, unprotected, a smoldering shadow of its past glory. And the news broke Nehemiah's heart. He was 900 miles away from a city he loved and could do nothing. Or could he? Have you ever been far away from somebody or something going on and think there's nothing I can do? Yeah, there is. We have resources, Christians. 
verse 5. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven. <laughs> Guess what you can always do? Pray. He's going to ask God, what can I do? My city's a mess. My people are, are destroyed. What can I do? <laughs> wow. There's always an option. Prayer, the first course of action. That always ought to be our action. That ought to be no matter what. Always our first course. And his prayer, Nehemiah reflects on God's covenant faithfulness. God is faithful, is he not? And when God says he's going to do something, he'll do it. And so he, 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 he goes through that in his prayer there, and you can read that later. And uh, in verse, uh, excuse me, in verse 11, he says, Oh, Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. He says, Lord, I'm going to go in and I'm going to make a plea to King Artaxerxes. <laughs> he says, help me to be prosperous. <laughs> because uh, as we'll see, uh, he's asking for boldness. He's going to go in with the right attitude, but he needs boldness. Nehemiah is distressed over Jerusalem. He walks into the presence of King Artaxerxes and guess what he says in verse 2 of chapter 2. Therefore the king said to me, why is your face sad? Now if you saw someone giving you a nasty looking face that they just tasted something that you were getting ready to drink, what would you think? <laughs> and, 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 and come to find out, which I didn't know, in the Persian culture the king required everyone to display a happy looking face in his presence. So if you had a bad day, it could be your last day. And so in he comes, he looks sad, and it says there in verse 2, he says, since you are not sick, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. So he said, I became dreadfully afraid. <laughs> he said, oh boy, <laughs> here I am, Lord. <laughs> and so what's he do? He's in this situation, he's in front of the king. The king says, what's going on? Nehemiah, I, don't, I have not seen that look on your face before. So what's he do? <clears throat> Verse 4, then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, I don't think this was a long one. <laughs> I just think he said, Lord, help me here. Lord, I need some, grant me what's on my heart. You already know that. And uh, so he... <laughs> The Lord works. Remember, we looked at the, the heart of a king is in the hands of the Lord as a river is. And, and he can guide it which direction he wants to. And he said, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant, has, verse 5, has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. No punishment. He's just interested. And, and, and then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be? Now, Nehemiah actually has been thinking about this for four months. Uh, if you check it out, you'll see that he started out, he heard about Jerusalem in Chis, the months Chislev. And what's that mean to you? Nothing, right? <laughs> That's November, December, <laughs> right in there. And he spoke with the king about the month Nisan, which is March, April. So four months later. So uh, he knew how long the trip would take. He knew that he needed royal letters for passages to go through those countries. It's 900 miles, remember? This is not just a, you know, he's not catching a plane. Not catching a train, <laughs> no taxi, no Uber. <laughs> they're going to walk and ride donkeys or whatever they're going to do to carry everything. And they needed the king's approval to, to get materials. And confidently, respectively, Nehemiah then asked for all these things. And then verse 8, and the king there at the end of, and the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. He knew right away who worked this out. God worked it out. The same words you hear about Ezra, God worked it out. And so he gives God the credit and uh, the king granted it 
because the hand of God was upon him. So, so step number one is good. He found out about the thing. He prayed about it. God answered his prayer. And now guess what? He's going to go. And he's going to go there and he's going to build the wall. In chapter 2, verses 11 through chapter 6, verse 19, he's going to go out and take a look at the wall. And it's bad. Burnt rubble. It's really bad. The gates are all burnt, gone. The stones are looking bad if they have torn them down. But always remember, as I told you before, that whenever you're doing something for the Lord, guess who shows up? And it'll happen again, chapter 2, verse 19. It says, But then Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it. They laughed at us and despised us and said, What is this thing? Let me get my Bible there. You are doing, will you rebel against the king? Now they came to rebuild the temple. I mean, the walls around Jerusalem. These powers around them are afraid that, guess what? Jerusalem's going to be back to their glory days. And at one time, Jerusalem, and they ran everything all around all this area. So they, but they, they do a trick. Will you rebel against the king? And uh, that's not really their, their intent but uh, that's, here we go. The opposition steps in. And they're always there throughout this. They'll always be there. They're there today. They're going to be there tomorrow. And they're going to keep on being there. But he's determined. Nehemiah wasn't intimidated. Why? Because the hand of his Lord as God was on him. And chapter 3 shows the great detail and organization with the work proceeded. He had one of those minds that could orchestrate and motivate people. He said, I'm going to tell you what, you start here, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this, and guess what? We'll have a wall. Some people can do that, right? They have that ability to do that. And God gave him that, and we would call that in the New Testament, the gift of administration. Because he won't do all the work, but he knows how to distribute those things out there and to give work to other people. The gates were repaired in chapter 3. And you have to read that. And, and gates were repaired. The doors were hung. Holes patched and the gold replaced. The thread of purpose and pride patched people together. You got people, everyone working. Priests, politics, craftsmen, commoner. They're all working together with one goal. They have all things in common. As it says in the book of Acts for the church, the people had all things in common. And I shared with the last time, for you and I to make the church work, we have to work together. We have to work together. You can't do that with a splinter group. We've got to work together. And you know what? People say, well, we're a small group here. You know what? There's only 12 people that started out with the apostles, too. And they tore the world upside down. And we want to, uh, we want to do that. Because, folks, I'm going to tell you straight out. If we don't get at it and get working, we won't be here that long. Because you know what? We're not getting any younger <laughs> we're not getting any younger and we've already had some of those folks slip off the glory since I've been here and we had Greg that went off uh, not long ago and our numbers dwindle <laughs> we have Sarah and Jody going to move away we have some people that haven't come back and maybe that won't come back and that, that's again we reach out to them but that's God's business God, God takes care of that but we need to do our part to see our church grow right Every person here doing our part to see our church grow. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I want to challenge you there, just as Nehemiah did. And uh, uh, this project was for the whole remnant. In chapter 4, the opposition, Sanballat, the governor of Samaria, and Tobiah, uh, the Ammonite, possible governor of the Transjordan, tried to stop the work with taunts and ridicule. When that didn't work, they threatened to use force. Now, it's happening in lots of places now to stop the church. They're using force. And uh, it, it could happen at any time right now. We're not facing that as far as force, but we are facing the taunts and the jeering and those kind of things. When that didn't work, they threatened force. Then God's people, guess what they did? They prayed for protection. They prayed for protection. Then Nehemiah posted guards around the wall. Look at chapter 4, verse 18. Some folks ask questions about these kind of things. 
Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And as you study the passage, you see they worked with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. <laughs> that, and, and if you would study Charles Spurgeon, his writings were in the sword and the trowel. <laughs> because you're going to have to need that. You're going to keep your sword up because we have an enemy. Remember? And what is our sword? The word of God. You got to have the word of God in one hand to do the work of God in the other hand. And, and so that's what's happening here. And these people are trusting God to protect them to build the wall around the city. Otherwise, they're trusting God to do what God had them to do at this time. And we need to do the same thing. And, uh, and the opposition, though, wasn't limited to the outside. And I don't know if you know it today, but if you study the New Testament, God warns about false teachers and false preachers and all them coming in. And guess what? They're here. <laughs> They're here. And you got that from the inside. Their work, this was what happening in chapter 5, the first five verses, we see that they were loaning money to the people because they didn't have money to live on, to do crops, and they would charge such a high interest that guess what? People can't pay it back. So they were selling themselves into slavery. They were selling their children into slavery. And that's not right. Knowing that the wall and the nation couldn't rise with this kind of infighting, Nehemiah confronted the lenders with their abuses. In response, they returned, to their, they returned their ill gotten gain in chapter 6 or verses 6 through 13. So that's kind of what happens in chapter 5. And Nehemiah confronts them. And he's going to show them Nehemiah is going to governor, be governor of their city, but he's not going to take their money or their food or nothing. And matter of fact, the transactions that are taking place, he's going to pay for himself. He's showing, as Paul did, remember what Paul did? Paul worked as a tent maker. And he says, I worked so that I wouldn't have to be a burden on you. And so he was bivocational. I've been that way pretty much since I started. You know, that's all right. As long as God keeps on giving me tents to fix, <laughs> I'm going to keep on fixing them, giving me the ability to do it. I, I, I'm not complaining about that. Sometimes I get tired, but you know what? God's strength is sufficient, right? God is able to get us through. It could be a whole lot worse. I could not have any work. We could not have income here. And then we wouldn't be here. But God, God takes care of those things. So he modeled that. And then at last, the wall's finished. Opposition, bad materials, Right now, we're facing high-priced materials, <laughs> and, uh, but the project's finished. And in chapter 6, uh, the project's finished, but Tobiah and Sambalat and the others, they keep on trying to entrap Nehemiah. They say, man, if this guy is gone, we could whip these people and we'll, we'll discourage them and we'll stop the work, stop the growing. And they tried to entrap him and get him in a room by himself where they could kill him. But Nehemiah saw through all that and God protected him. And in chapter 6, verse 15, it says this. And really, this is pretty amazing because if you would go back and see the taunts of Tobiah and Sam Bellet, they said, man, even a fox could knock that wall down. That's what they said. They, they did everything. They said, man, that thing couldn't keep anybody out. Anybody could knock that down because the materials were bad, but uh, it ended up being done right and, and secure. And in verse 15, it says, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elu in 52 days. 52 days, the wall was finished. Chapter 7 says, then it was when the wall was built and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed, that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hananiah, and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. So he turns over leadership for a little while, because guess what? Remember what he was? He was a cupbearer to the king. <laughs> so he goes back there, 
and, and works with the king. And in chapter 7, we see him as governor. Some time he comes back and he becomes governor. And uh, he, he has the doors and the gates and all that done. And now he says it's time to work on the people. Get the walls done. So now I got to work on the people. And in chapter 7, he takes the list. There's all those names of the people that had come with Zerubbabel. Remember, he was the leader back in Ezra. <coughs> Once he had a feel for who was living in Jerusalem, he assembled them at the water gate. And, and it says in, ch in chapter 7, verse 5, he says, Then my God put in my heart to gather the nobles, the rulers and the people that might be registered by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. So he, God put in his heart to find out who we got here. What, what people do we have here? Who am I talking to? Who am I going to minister to here and put in positions? And he does that. <coughs> and he puts them, gets them all together. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to have them hear the word of God. Chapter 8, as we move there, guess what? He got them all standing there. Guess who's going to read the Word of God to them? Ezra. Ezra got there 14 years earlier. He's been teaching the Word of God. Remember, we looked at that at the last few things there of Ezra. And he's going to teach them the Word of God. <coughs> it says in verse 4, chapter 8, Then Ezra stood on a platform. You know what? That's one of the first times anybody stood on a platform to preach. <laughs> and he got up there and he preached and he taught the people. But he didn't stop there. And this is important. That's why I believe Sunday school and those kind of things are important. It says that the Levites and the scribes walked around amongst the people and said, did you understand that? Did you understand that? And I think that's what we do in Sunday school. We can ask questions and find out, do you understand that? Or are you just reading it? It was important that these people went around and did that. That's, that's the important part of the leadership in the church's job is make sure you hear the word, but also make sure you understand it. Because if you don't understand it, what good does it do you? And so that's what's taking place. And it says when they, that <coughs> Ezra blessed the Lord, verse 6, the great God, then all the people answered, Amen and Amen. They lifted up their hands. Now they weren't Pentecostal. <laughs> They lifted up their hands and praised God. And you know, and I tell you that, and, and I was talking, Lynette's not here today. She likes to raise her hands once in a while. That's all right. You can raise your hands anytime you want. You can say amen when you want. They said it twice. And amen, amen. That's all right. Now, <clears throat> with that, remember, that doesn't mean that your neighbor sitting beside you has to do that. That's your freedom. If you want to raise your hands, you want to say amen, go ahead and do that. You're free to do that. No one here, I would think, would look down upon you for doing that. Now, if you start jumping over pews and laying in the aisle, then we might be looking at you as a little different. But each man his own, I guess. And uh, the Levites there, it says in verse 7, helped the people understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book and the law of God, and they gave them the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And again, that, that, that's our job. And so... The wall is built. We got people singing. We got choirs going on. And then one of my favorite verses in Nehemiah and Nehemiah 8.10. And then he said to them, uh, oh, oh yeah, before I go there, people are crying and weeping. Verse 9. They're crying and weeping. But he says, guess what, folks? Don't cry and weep. Let's celebrate. This is exciting. And then he says there in verse 10, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. When nothing else, there's no payday, <laughs> there's no anything. Well, guess what? The joy of the Lord is your strength. God always gives you that joy when you do what God would have you to do. If you do God's work, God's way, you get God's results. He gets the glory, you get the joy. <laughs> and, uh, uh, 
I've seen that happen in, in, in so many areas with missionaries, with people when they come in and start a church and they see that church building up and they see that little group of people gathered together and that's where it starts. And there's just joy in seeing those things going on. Uh, seeing someone come to know the Lord, see them growing in the Lord. It's just a joy about that. I can't explain. It's just an exciting thing. And uh, th those of you who have worked with kids, you can understand that. You see a kid grow up and you think, man, that kid is a rotten little spoiled brat. And that's thing you know, he's your youth pastor. God takes that boy and as you teach him, he changes them. He prepares them for service. And, and, and uh, whenever I go to Fish Lake, uh, the, well, I only have one of the ladies left now that was when I went to vacation Bible school and she, I told you she was really nice. She just said I was a rascal. That was very nice. I was not a rascal. I was worse than a rascal. But God has places for rascals too. And uh, so uh, he does that for rascals and radicals. So they hear the word and our time's up. So we're going to stop there and that point three and pick up there next week. As we see a celebration going on, as the Word of God goes forth, it does a work in hearts. And that's our desire here, that the Word of God will go to work in hearts and um, we'll see a recommitment to this book, a recommitment to the local church. But you know what's most of all? A recommitment to the Lord. That's what's important. Because I believe if you get your heart right with God, that all those other things will come in place. If you love the Lord, you'll be in his word. If you love the Lord, you don't mind giving your money. If you love the Lord, you don't mind giving of your time. Now, when I say money, it's time, talent, and treasures. But sometimes God just wants you, what? Your time. That's the hardest one today. And if I would ask most people, what's the hardest thing to do today? I'd say, give my time. Because Why? Because we're all busy. Our schedules are so full. And I'm guilty of that one. And, I, I, and I've been looking on trying to, how to simplify my life. Where I'm not as busy that I am. Because I, I don't like how busy I am. Let's just put it that way. And besides, I'm getting older. <laughs> and my body just doesn't recover like it used to. Right, bud? Have you work on a roof for a whole day? Are you ready for a roof for a whole day today? Probably not, right? <laughs> I mean, either. I had a lady just ask me about, will you do that roof? I said, nope. <laughs> I said, they make young guys that do that kind of stuff. I said, this old guy does not do those. I, weebles wobble, but they fall down and they break. And I said, I just don't want to fall down and break. I don't do those anymore. And, uh, but I, I want to have more time for what? The Lord. And the work of the Lord. Uh, that, that, that's my goal. I'm getting closer to retirement age. And, uh, <laughs> right, sister? We're, 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 we're running along the same path there. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to having more time dedicated to ministering to people. Because people is what's important. And I haven't been able to do that to my fullest extent because of things that are going on. And, I, and it breaks my heart. And, and I, I'm going to share a story with Bud because Bud was, was faithful in sharing with me. How come you didn't come see me? Or his wife said, I didn't even see him why we had the pandemic. And you know what? I was too stinking busy. That's, that's no excuse. And I'm not, don't look at Bud any negative there. That's a, you know, you need to be honest with people. And he was being honest. He didn't, he wasn't hateful, nothing like that. But you know what? I should have been there. I should have been there. I'm a pastor, right? Pastor cares for his people. He takes care of his people. I should have been there. I should have been in lots of things that I haven't been able to be to. Uh, and uh, it breaks my heart that sometimes my schedule doesn't allow me to be where I want to be. And uh, so anyhow, uh, uh, so I want to recommit myself to the Lord and to the Lord's work. And I pray that as we go through these passages, the Lord will do that too. Sue. So